This is how you catch a monster wave. 1960s Gidget style. Unfortunately, the days of filming a surf movie without even getting your hair wet are over. Whoa, look at that, Jonathan, damn. Yeah. This is what it takes now. A team of specialists with nerves of steel and a collection of technology like something out of Terminator 2. An all-star Australian crew is in the final stages of something extraordinary in the history of surf movie making. And it truly is a hell of a ride. It's the next big game changer. The Monster Wave surf movie is going 3D. For most of its history, the surf flick was a rather low-tech, even spiritual affair. Then along comes a man with a crazy dream. He is, of course, the producer. We thought, let's make Storm Surfers in 3D. And that sounded like a really exciting idea and everyone went, yeah, OK, do it. Here's the money. And I went, oh no, how are we actually going to do this? Because the technology simply doesn't exist. Now, what you need to understand is the sheer complexity of what they were taking on. So, for those of you who kind of understand how 3D works, but kind of don't, and I'd include myself in that till recently, here's a little refresher. The reason we see in 3D normally is a little trick played between our eyes and the brain. Stereopsis, it's called. That's where the brain takes the two slightly different pictures it gets from your two eyes and fuses them to form a depth-perceiving 3D view of the world. That's what a 3D camera has to do. Capture two different views, similar enough to the distance between our eyes that the brain can work it out. And then to view it, you need glasses that filter the correct view. There are a few ways you can do it. This is the classic red-blue glasses way. Red eye sees one view, blue eye sees another. It sort of works. These are what you see in the 3D cinemas now. These are called passive glasses and these harness polarised light. Light travels or is polarised in either one direction or the other. So on screen, the image for the left eye is polarised one way, the image for the right the other, and the glasses let the correct one through. Now these are the so-called active glasses. These are what a lot of your 3D televisions will use. And these are way more freaky. These work by alternately blocking the left and right eye 120 times per second. And the screen is flicking between left and right eye views at the same rate. It's mind boggling, frankly. And speaking of mind-boggling, look at what it takes to film it. The cameras use two synchronised lenses to capture what our eyes would see from their six centimetre apart position. And they look like something out of a science fiction film. Only our team weren't planning on taking them to a nice controlled movie studio. They were planning to go here. Quarum up by me is two kilometres offshore. This wave is over a shallow reef. It doesn't start breaking until it's around 15 feet. So it gets really, really hairy. This wave is just a nasty piece of work. It's literally got jaws and when you take off on them. You know, it's almost got teeth jumping out of the wave at the surfer. It just doesn't look possible. And with the then existing 3D cameras? They were too big. They were huge. They looked like a fridge. And if you fall in the water in front of one of these big waves, you're going to the bottom. First challenge. They needed a new kind of 3D camera, a small one. 
small enough you could mount it on a jet ski or even a board without risking the rider's life. Luckily, one company were about to come to the rescue. This is what answered all our prayers. This is a GoPro. This is a 3D GoPro. It's two normal 2D GoPros. Yeah. One's flipped upside down. Yeah. They have a synchronisation cable <laughs> attaching them. Yeah. And look at the size of them. We put a flat port GoPro right on the front of the board. Yeah. And not only does it get an amazing shot as the barrel's coming over yeah, top yeah. of Tom, <laughs> but underwater, you know, I designed these flat yeah. ports and a flat port changes the optics yeah. so that uh, it focuses underwater. So we get this amazing... So you invent, you, you got this and then you technologically fiddled. We fiddled with a lot of these. <laughs> very few you of our GoPros, <laughs> very few of our GoPros are stock standard anymore. Right. But that was just the start because there was another wee problem the makers of Avatar didn't have. How do you keep the cameras dry out here? You see, if you get water on one lens and not the other, the viewer's brain can't handle it. If you're yeah. looking at the screen, you can yeah. see one eye's got a droplet on it and you'll blink trying to get rid of it. It's called violation. Dean tried leaf blowers, compressors, until at last, 10 prototypes and yet another weekend in the workshop later, he developed the air knife. What we came up with was the two jets run by these little scuba tanks here. It's really simple, I'll show you how it works. Okay, cool. There's a, a switch up here that yep. the, the rider can hit and... All right. There you go. Air out of the tank, straight through those jets, keeps all the water off. Okay, I'm ready to test it. Right, ready? you ready? Air on. <laughs> you see water sprays off here and there, flies off everywhere, but it keeps the lenses clear, and that's the key. Satisfying, high yeah. five. Meanwhile, on to the next big challenge in shooting a surf movie in 3D. Normally, in 2D, you can be a long way away and zoom the camera right in. Or you can be close up and the background is still there. But that doesn't quite work in 3D. The closest thing I can show you to what happens is this. If you focus on your finger and bring it in, at some point, the image will split into two. Well, in 3D, if they get it wrong, you can have the finger in the foreground just fine and the background can split. To prevent that, all sorts of things need to happen at once. This is the beam splitter. Right. So the reason we have a beam splitter, and, and this is about as small as they get, even though it's still quite heavy and still yeah, quite large. Well, you're, you're trying to go handheld with this. Yeah, well, we had to. It's observational documentary. We yeah. have to follow them around. And to do that, you need a beam splitter because to put the two cameras side by side, these cameras would be 70 mil apart. Which, which is, is much further than your wider eyes. than your eyes. Yeah. So to bring them closer, we use a mirror at an angle and one camera shoots through the mirror the other camera shoots onto the reflection of the mirror. We can bring them all the way together. It's yeah. pretty much 2D. Yeah. But then when we bring it apart, we increase the amount of 3D volume that you get. And if you go too far the other way... Your eyes diverge, which means they try and look outwards. Are you kidding? They try I don't think I can even make that. Well, you can't. You, you don't have the muscles to do that. So it, no, it, it, hurts. Hurts. it hurts your brain, your head's going to explode, doesn't work. <laughs> now, if I go in closer with that leaving it the same setting... Not only is it vital to control lens separation, but also convergence. The angle between the lenses, and every camera pair has a different focal length. All in all, to get the camera angles they needed, they developed seven different 3D rigs with 26 different cameras. Board cam, surfer cam, jet ski cam, water cam, boat cam, chopper cam. And then they took all their pampered, highly customised cameras into this. It was unlike anything anyone had tried before. The degree of difficulty for shooting in 3D is like to the power of three compared to just shooting on a normal camera. Everything's bigger, everything's more complex. So I'm sitting on the back of a jet ski and I'm sitting there fiddling with the camera trying to get the convergence right and the iris correct and the focus right. My director's going, quick, here it comes, here it comes, we're going, we're going. Yeah, it was really dangerous. 
even for the experienced big wave riders, this power to the three complexity was beyond anything they'd faced. I was towing Ross onto the wave and this time I was commentating into the mic and also I was working the air knife, of, which was new to me as well, on the rig. As I was concentrating going over the top of the wave, I felt a hit from the side and then I felt this the 600 kilogram jet ski tilt back into the wave and I saw Ross turn underneath me and at that point I was become really scared. I knew that I had to grip onto the, the jet ski and not jump off and then try and lend it away from Ross as much as best I possibly could. And then I, then I just went down with it all the way down to the bottom and then just got blown off the thing like in one apocalyptic moment. Boom. But after months of crazy 20-hour days, technological ingenuity and three times the danger, effort and sheer time anyone could have imagined, after all that, the outcome, the art, is quite honestly extraordinary. I reached out for the screen when I saw that wave, as did everybody else in the theatre. And I'm only sorry you can't see everything we can see, because I can tell you, while the action is astonishing, terrifying even, the thing that surprises me most about this experience is its sheer beauty. This, in 3D, looks beautiful. <laughs>